The following podcast contains explicit language. A few weeks ago, I got an email from a man named Paul with an odd story. He'd been injured by somebody at work. Not a colleague, but they were based in the same building. Paul had a photograph of a wound on his hand, red and raw. But the thing that really bothered him was that the guy who did it died in 1943. It was the kind of email you just can't ignore. Do ghosts exist? If not, why do we see them? This is Haunted. Each episode will explore one person's ghost story in forensic detail. Not just what happened, but why. Take a look at my hand now. Okay, there's a scar there. So, I mean, it's still not completely healed. I'm Danny Robbins, and this is episode six. The man who upset a ghost. The church clock strikes eight as I arrive in the old market town of Shepton Mallet in Somerset in the west of England. It's cold. My breath floats in the night air. I'm here to meet Paul. He works at the town's prison. First built in 1610, Shepton Mallet was the UK's oldest prison until it closed in 2013. Now it's due to be turned into flats. But until the developers move in, it's Paul's job to give guided tours. And at weekends, there are ghost hunts, exploring the prison's haunted reputation. As I knock at the prison gates, cars are pulling up. People are arriving for tonight's hunt, armed with torches, coffee and thermal underwear. The heavy door swings open and I'm greeted by Paul. It's nice to put a face to the email. He's open, friendly, with big features and expressive eyebrows. Like a cartoon character brought to life. Paul, why are you here? How did you come to be working here? Well, uh, I I saw the job advertised as a site manager for for Shepton Manic Prison. I thought, well, this is really for me because I I love local history. I love meeting people. And what an awesome site to actually, you know, be, be working in. Do you still feel like that? I, I do, I do. Do you know what? Out of all the work I've had in, in my 42 years on this planet, I think this is the only job I, actually where I get up in the morning and think, yeah, I'm going to work and I'm going to enjoy it. Even after what happened? No, I, I still look forward to it. I'm more cautious about my experience here. An empty prison is like a bruise, a dark reminder of pain. Before the ghost hunt starts, Paul's promised to show me around and tell me the story of how he received an injury from a dead man. Paul leads us into the main building, and I feel a little flutter in my stomach at what the night may hold. If I take my torch off now, we will be plunged into darkness. Uh, It's a place I never walk around without a torch, especially at night time. It absolutely frightens the living daylights out of me. The torch beam picks out thick walls, unforgiving bars, and netting above our heads. That's the suicide netting. That's to stop people throwing themselves. Yeah, to, to end their misery here, yeah. Over the centuries, Shepton Mallet grew infamous as a place of unusually brutal punishment, forced labor and execution. During World War II, it was commandeered as an American military prison, housing GIs who committed crimes on British soil. Many of them hanged after summary trials based on unreliable evidence. We enter Sea Wing and Paul turns off his torch. The dark envelops, holds us like a gloved fist. This is a wing which caused an investigation in 1967 by the Home Office. Four officers wouldn't work a night duty here. They said they experienced a very, very strange wisping wind come all the way through this wing, a sweet smell of perfume, 
And one of them said that they actually saw a lady wearing a white dress standing on the stairs at the end, just down there. And there is a little bit of a story attached to this wing. Uh, there was a lady who had murdered her fiance. Subsequently, she was sentenced to death, so she came here to Shepton Manor. Now, back in those days for British executions, they did give her her final wish. Well, her final wish was to wear her white wedding dress. So they went outside, retrieved it, brought it into the prison. She put it on, she wore it to bed that night. When the officers came to retrieve her the next morning for execution, she was already dead. Post-mortem was carried out, no sign, didn't have a clue how she died, no suicide. They put it down that she actually died of a broken heart. And that's the story of the white lady that still roams these wings today. Paul's words and the disorientating darkness combine to make me feel that if I turned to look down the corridor, I would see her. The mind is a powerful thing. It's stories like this that draw people to the ghost hunting tours here. We head down to the former canteen, where tonight's group are receiving their safety briefing. We won't walk into a room and put a finger on the glass and the glass starts being like crazy. It doesn't happen. There will be times you'll be sitting in a room, 20 minutes, nothing happens at all. The glass won't move, the table won't move, the weed board doesn't... Just Each person room. has paid to spend the night here, in the hope that, like Paul, they'll have a ghostly experience. A congregation of believers gathered to await a sign. And Paul is the man with the paranormal stigmata. But to make sure I stay level-headed, I brought an unbeliever with me. My plus one is Haley Stevens. She's a paranormal researcher, a hardened skeptic, but in her teenage years she was an avid ghost hunter. She's poacher turned gamekeeper. Hayley, you've been on lots of these kind of ghost hunts before, haven't you? Not quite like these. I've never been on a ghost hunt with about 40 people. This is a lot of people, isn't it? Yes. It's a lot of couples. A lot of couples, it's it is actually. a weird actually. couple activity. People have come for their, their, their night out, haven't they? Date night. Yeah. <laughs> Date night at Shepton Mallet Prison. <laughs> There's quite an excited atmosphere in the air. Yes. I'm keen to know what Hayley will make of Paul's injury. But first, we're introduced to one of the ghost hunters. Phil is from a group called Haunted Happenings. Shaven-headed, he's a car salesman by day and ghost hunter by night. You come here most weekends, don't you? I do, yes. And yeah. Have you seen lots of things here? I've seen shadows here. Uh, we've had lots of doors banged here. When you say shadows, yeah. like, I mean, obviously there's a lot of shadows here, but do you mean yeah. unusual shadows? Very unusual ones. So, like, we'll be standing in the middle of the floor for argument, say, and you'll see a shadow in a doorway. And it's just like it's just like someone standing there, but completely black. If that makes sense okay. to you. Before we explore the prison further, I ask Haley what she expects from tonight. There will be knocking noises. People will hear shuffling noises. They'll probably see things from the corner of their eyes. Some people might get touched and say that their coat was tugged on or their arms were touched. People might hear whispering voices. They'll hear messages that seem to respond to their questions, or they might hear their names or words that are familiar to them, that have meaning to them. When you were doing your ghost hunts, were you conscious of stage managing it, that, that it was a kind of a certain theatre to it? When we did our ghost hunts, it was a team of friends who would go out, um, so it wasn't members of the public like this event here tonight but even with a group of friends as the person who had organized the event there was a slight pressure that something had to happen and so we wouldn't necessarily stage manage it and make things happen but that probably played a role in how we interpreted things that happened around us so any little noise any slight movement would suddenly become a big thing because there was that pressure for something to happen people have paid quite a bit of money to be here mm -hmm. they want to see ghosts yeah so they probably will see ghosts, but it doesn't mean there are any ghosts. If the spirits do appear, then one place seems more likely than any other. A building known as the Hanging Shed, where 18 GIs were executed during World War II. Many protesting their innocence as the noose was put around their necks. And it's the place where Paul claims he was attacked by one of them. Coming up, Paul upsets a ghost. I had a searing pain on my left hand. I looked down at my hand and it was red raw. 
and on the outside of that wound uh, was a black mark. Of the 18 US servicemen who were executed at Shepton Mallet, 10 were black and three were Hispanic, whereas the army itself was 90% white. The Visiting Forces Act meant that GIs were subject to American, not British law. The trials were sometimes only one day long, conducted in secret, using unreliable evidence. The US Army had brought chewing gum and Coca-Cola to Britain, but also a segregation and prejudice that shocked the British. I'm with Paul and Haley, heading through the pitch-black corridors of the prison, to the place where every one of these doomed soldiers spent their last night. The condemned man's cell. You're hit by something as you walk in here, and I think that's totally unconnected to any ghostly activity. You're just hit by the sense that it would be absolutely horrific to be in this room. Originally, of course, there would have been the cell door there, there would have been a spy hole on it. Mm -hmm. Behind me, there would have been a bookcase, and I'll tell you why there would have been a bookcase in, in a few seconds. Now, normally, the day before the execution took place, the executioner and the executioner's assistant would arrive at the prison. The most famous executioner in the British Isles, uh, Thomas and Albert Pierpoint, you might have heard of them, mm -hmm. top of their game. And I'm right in thinking that when they hang American GIs here in the mm -hmm. war, he didn't like the way they were executing them, did he? Because the Americans made the men wait. Yeah, when Albert Pierpoint was doing his executions, uh, the civilian ones, from the moment he entered the condemned man's cell to the moment the trap doors opened, a record time of 7.5 seconds when he was doing American GI executions. They could be on the trap doors for seven, eight minutes before their charge was read out, their history. Pierpoint hated that. He wanted a quick execution. Why was there a bookcase? On the morning of the execution, just before eight o'clock, the executioner's assistant would arrive, stand up the prisoner, the condemned man, bind his hands together behind his back, and then that bookcase would be moved out of the way, and then to the prisoner's horror, behind this bookcase here, the gallows. Bloody hell. For all that Paul claims to be scared by the building, I can't help feeling he relishes telling these tales. Their power to scare and move. But perhaps they are too powerful. Paul worries that it's the tours that caused his injury. That somehow the ghost hunts have riled the spirits, stirred up a spectral hornet's nest. Now, as we enter the execution chamber, he tells me about the thing that first drew me here. A photograph of a wound still fresh, and that very odd question. How can a man be attacked by a ghost? The only thing different I did on that particular tour, and it was on Saturday, August 19th, it was my three o'clock tour, i never forget that. 30 folks in this room where we're standing now, the only thing different I did is I mentioned a GI's name, privately Davis. He'd taken two girls out for the night. One of them he shot dead, the other he raped. Subsequently, he was court-martialed. Like all the other executions, they brought him directly to Shepton Mallet Prison, placed him into the condemned man's cell. He couldn't believe that was his fate. He couldn't believe that he was going to be executed in a foreign land. And on the morning of the execution, as that bookcase was moved out of the way, which then obviously revealed the gallows, his knees buckled, he wet himself, and one of his last words were, oh my God, I'm going to die. The only thing different with that particular tour is I told that story, and as I told that story, I had a searing pain on my left hand. I looked down at my hand and it was red raw, and on the outside of that wound uh, was a black mark, and I can only describe it as if somebody had put a cigarette out on my hand. We're now in November, mm -hmm. quite some time after. Take a look at my hand now. Okay, there's a scar there. So, I mean, it's still not completely healed. I mean, I've never had a cigarette put out on me, mm. but the pain was quite excruciating. I have to ask the probably stupid question, but mm. there wasn't anyone smoking in that no. room. None of the tour party was smoking. Absolutely not. No, okay. no, no, of course not. No. It just happened just, just like that. Just as I was telling the story of his last words, 
oh my God, I'm going to die, just then. Throughout this evening, Paul's wife, Nikki, has accompanied us, silently watching and listening. Nikki, what do you think? I was ever the sceptic. <laughs> I know when Paul's telling the truth and I know when he's lying, <laughs> really obviously. And yeah, he, he was dead serious about that. And then he was worried. He does take it more serious than he lets on. He comes home and says, oh, you don't think something's come home with me, do you? You don't think there's spirits in the house? How do we explain this then? I like to have science behind things. Then. <laughs> yeah, reasoning. Smoking's prohibited, so that's definitely out. So I don't know. It reminds me of one of those locked room mysteries so popular in detective fiction. Later, when we have a moment to ourselves, I ask Haley what she makes of Paul's theory that he upset a ghost and paid the price. Part of me thinks perhaps the burn could have been on his hand before and he only really noticed it being in that room. As much as he seemed genuine, and he did seem genuine, the only information we have to go on is what he's telling us. And we know that eyewitness testimony isn't very reliable. And, OK, he's got the burn. So the most logical explanation is that it's a cigarette burn and that there's no paranormal element to it. Um, now, that would suggest he's lying. I have no proof that he's lying, but it's usually the simplest explanation that ticks all the boxes. I feel awkward even talking about this because it's not nice to be doubting someone's word, is it? As we know, when it comes to recalling things that happen to us, we embellish our memories and the context in which we're recalling what happened to us can influence the way in which we recall the memory. So, you might pick up a cigarette burn during the day, but it's only when you're in a room where you know there was a GI executed and the GI was a chain smoker who had a last cigarette that suddenly the two connect in your head. To me, that makes more sense than the idea that a ghost gave him a cigarette burn. What Haley says makes sense. I'm left with an odd feeling. I like Paul. I can feel his earnestness, his desperation to be taken seriously. Of course, I've said this loads of times. I've told you tonight and I've not had any, any uh, you know, paranormal phenomenon. Nothing's happened to me. And people ask me, well, why do you, why do you tell the story? Because it could happen. And I almost think, well, well, I kind of want it to happen because then you would say, well, yeah, yeah, you're right, Paul, it did happen. But it also strikes me that even Nikki, the person closest to Paul, isn't totally convinced. And yet, why would you make up a story like this? Telling people that you were burnt by a ghost, it could look mad. I take my odd feeling with me as we head back to the main ghost hunting group. People are breaking off into smaller teams to explore the prison armed with electromagnetic field detectors and Ouija boards. The air bristles with anticipation. It is time to contact the dead. It's midnight, the hour at which they used to hang men here. I'm in darkness, so thick it sits like a cape over our small group. In front of us, on a table, lies a Ouija board. And I feel a little nervous because the plan is to talk to the spirits. There's a particular prisoner we were talking about earlier, a, a black GI called Private Lee Davis. Right. And I was wondering if we could try and contact him. Of course we can, yeah. But are we chasing shadows or stirring the nest? If you just put one finger on the glass, very, very lightly. OK, good evening, spirits. If you can hear my voice, can you please come forward for me? And I'd like you to move the glass for me. And if you can just take the glass to yes for me to let us know that you're here, please. Move the glass to the person that you would like to communicate with. Or if anyone here reminds you of anyone you used to know, just take the glass to that person for me, please. And of course, the glass does move. It's moving towards me. Okay. Come on, spirit, keep using the energy for me. Take the glass to the person that you'd like to communicate with. We've all come here this evening because we want to communicate with you. It's your chance to have a voice. 
It moved towards me, but then it moved back. Okay, okay then, Spirit. If you don't want to go to someone in particular, can you move the glass to the initial of your first name for me, please? So, come on. It's going towards D. Keep using everyone's energy. A. Just as I think we could be spelling Lee Davis's surname, things take a surprising turn. Five. OK, Spirit, is that how old you were? Phil believes we've contacted the ghost of a five-year-old child, who he thinks has a connection with one of our group, a woman named Claire. Spirit, have you come with Claire? Claire asks the Spirit questions. How many children does Claire have, Spirit? Can you go to that number, please? Well done. Well done. <laughs> I do have two children. Afterwards... Haley gives me a possible explanation for what I've witnessed. The movements when using a Ouija board, the movements of the planchette or the glass, um, are caused by idiomotor responses, which is involuntary muscular movement, which means you don't know necessarily that you're doing it. On one hand, people could be faking it on purpose and moving it. On the other hand, it could be idiomotor responses. And when you're in a, um, a ghost hunting group or in an event like this, and you have certain expectations, you can unconsciously influence the glass or the planchette to move it in relation to the answers that you're expecting. And so there was one experiment where people were blindfolded and the board was switched from a round board to a square board and the planchette moved with the original board shape in mind even though it had been changed around. As we take a break, I find Claire, the woman who was targeted by the spirit. I know I'd feel unsettled by what happened to her, whether it was spectral or man-made. Claire, what did you make of what happened with the Ouija board? Well, quite shocked, to be honest with you. I don't know any five-year-old passed away or anything like that. By the signs of it, they were living in the house before I was, and they just came with me tonight. So, yeah, big shock. Do you believe that was somebody genuinely trying to get a message to you? Um, I've heard giggling in my house before from a little child, so I don't know if it's from that. I really don't know. Because then I asked about my dad who passed away a few years ago, and then they ended it, so I really don't know. Had you done a Ouija board before? No, never. Never really believed in it before, but... Um, I think I do now. <laughs> I would be a bit rattled now if the no. spirit had been trying to contact me directly. No, I, no, not at all. I, I just wonder what they're doing with me, really, why they're with me. It's a bit sort of intriguing, really. All night, the collective yearning for something to happen has been palpable. Our hunger for the empty prison's dead to come back to life. You know how I feel? I desperately want to believe... I'd love something to happen. Mm -hmm. I'd love to walk down that corridor and see the lady in white. Well, sceptics do see weird things, but it doesn't necessarily mean there was something there. So you, it, it could happen. Don't give up hope. It, it could happen. You could see a ghost. But just remember, it doesn't mean there's a ghost there. So simply seeing a ghost isn't enough? No, it really isn't. Haley would say this yearning is what pushed a glass around a table and turn shadows into phantoms. People need ghosts. And buildings need them too. Because without ghosts, Shepton Mallet is an old shell waiting to be gutted and turned into flats. All the emotion, tragedy and pain bulldozed clean by modernity. But with the ghosts, the past lives on. And the old wings are full again. This place of death and punishment has become a theme park. The biggest shock of the evening came unexpectedly. Paul was showing me the lower room of the hanging shed, where the GI's bodies would have fallen through the trapdoor and then hung there, swinging, until they were cut down and taken to be buried in unmarked graves. Just in the, in the centre there, of course, would have been uh, the trap door. The body would have been hanging there. So I'm six foot two. Look at me. My feet would have been roughly about three and a half feet off of the floor. Okay. That's where I would have remained for one hour. For an hour? For an hour on the rope. The body would have been taken oh down. Oh, God, bloody hell. Oh, no. You did that on purpose, didn't what? you? What? I don't see anything. Oh, honestly. The, 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 there's a body hanging down there, a fake body with uh, a blood splattered sheet all over it. That is way, very freaky. That's almost a little you bit of Hollywood. No, 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 of course not. <laughs> no. That's our little bit of Hollywood. Oh, that's, that's, honestly, that is, that is outrageous.
outrageous. That's left over from Halloween, of course. No, I you really have taken me out down. there. I know, I know. I'm sorry. Honestly. Yeah. Um, that's why. That's why. That's that's why you came here. You wanted a little bit of spooking, didn't you? I guess Paul is right. This is why I came here: to feel my pulse racing, my heart hammering inside my chest, the adrenaline of the theme park ride. And yet, after talking about the way these young men died, falling through the trapdoor, screaming, this makes me feel uncomfortable. I've heard it said that farce is tragedy speeded up, the pace of events removing us from their terrible reality. I wonder if this is true of ghost hunting, death, pain, terror, repackaged as entertainment. Perhaps Paul was right, and we really are pissing off the dead. As I try to ignore the swinging mannequin, there's one last thing I want to ask Paul about. Is this your entertainer side coming out? I, I, I read that you're an entertainer as well. Is that true? Uh, uh, well, I used to be. I used to. Be. I used to work on cruise ships, and I was a compare presenter, etc. Did you do karaoke nights? Well? I, I did. How, how did you? Oh, know I, that? I googled you. Oh, you didn't. Yeah, well, because you've become quite famous about this, haven't you? About this, there's been, been in a few tabloids. Yeah, a couple of people come in. I don't know who they are. You're a Paul. You still got that burn on your hand? <laughs> yeah. But how did the papers find out about it? One of the reporters, unbeknown to me, were actually on a tour. And, of course, this local reporter did a little interview afterwards. Okay. And yeah, did, did you write to any papers or, or sort of tell people about it? I did write off to another little paper. You might have heard of The, the Sun. OK. Right, and then, and then they... <laughs> the, the biggest newspaper in the UK. <laughs> well, you know, it, just a little email, and then they picked up on it, so which is okay. quite good, really, you know. It's, it's a funny thing to be famous for being burnt by a ghost. Yeah, but it's quite cool as well, don't you think? I mean, it's, it's not a great thing to have actually happened, but, you know, it's still... I was burnt. I don't know who burnt me, you know. No, it's, it is. It's awesome. It's the unexplained, isn't it? Mm. You can find the newspaper accounts of Paul's story online. Read them, and you'll see the photo of his hand. It is definitely a cigarette burn. But did it come from the spirit realm, or somewhere closer to Earth? As I leave, Paul tells me that the prison, like a condemned man, has earned a stay of execution. The developers have been delayed. The ghost tours will continue. Paul may have upset the ghosts, but he's also keeping them in business. With his odd story and his scar, he's the keeper of Shepton Mallet's flame. And keepers of flames sometimes get burnt. Thank you to Paul, Haley, and the Haunted Happenings team. If you've had a ghostly experience, we'd like to hear from you. Send an email to haunted at panoply.fm or find me on Twitter or Facebook. Thank you to everyone who's reviewed or rated the show so far. If you've enjoyed it, please tell someone you know. Haunted is a chalk and blade production for Panoply. It was written and presented by me, Danny Robbins. The producers are Ruth Barnes, Laura Sheeta, and Simon Barnard. Music and sound design is by Pascal Wise. Jesse Brown painted our artwork. Special thanks to Ryan Dilly and Andy Bowers at Panoply. Until next time, sleep well. <laughs>